on to our final tip tech session. So sad. Uh, this is going to be the civic tech and government session. We're going to have three presentations. Our speakers, Christoph Izdebski, uh, Dawn McDougall and Jill Briers, uh, and Benjamin Siebel, uh, each giving about 20 minutes of presentations, and then we'll have 15 minutes at the end for questions and discussion. So I will hand over to our right. first speaker. Uh, right. yeah. well, oh. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. Um, good evening. Hello. I will. Uh, I will try to be uh, brief on a very complicated issue, actually, on the uh, civic tech and government collaboration. Uh, it's also important when I'm introducing myself uh, to say that I have. There was, uh, I think, the Google representative yesterday talking about different hats. Uh, so I'm a boring lawyer. Uh, frustrated former public official and very enthusiastic activist. Uh, so this is a pretty good combination, I would say, for uh, talking on on the topic. Uh, but also, if you um, interested in uh, the other things that we're doing, we're trying to make some researches as what's going on with the city tech or digital social innovation. Uh, in the uh, European Union, I have some copies of uh, our report uh, we delivered quite recently uh, within the consortium with, uh, with other organizations. But, come back to the, uh, to the main topic, um, the context is uh, simple and not simple at the same time. It's simple because the most, and I'm saying that as the former public official, uh, the public officials everywhere are more or less the same because we are all humans and uh, this is also important in any kind of a collaboration to remember that we're working with humans and we are humans ourselves. Um, uh, so we have our dreams, our expectations, our problems and, uh, and sometimes we have even our solutions uh, that uh, are coordinating with, uh, coordinated with um, other people. Uh, but um, what is important in this presentation is I'm also telling you that from the perspective of some people saying semi-authoritarian states or as they describe themselves, illiberal democracies. So the way how I'm kind of jealous sometimes that it's easy on the political uh, level to work with the government uh, it's not all. all um, uh, it's not the case uh, in in every uh, in every country. Uh, so uh, some tips on collaboration that I will just present to you in a, in a moment uh, are those models of collaboration that can work in a country such as Poland, Hungary, or other country that is called themselves uh, illiberal um, democracy. Uh, you see the title, Let Our Powers Combine. Does anyone know what it referred to? Do you know the quote? Captain Planet? Yeah, <laughs> this is Captain Planet. This is one of my uh, really favorite cartoons when I was uh, a kid. And what I really liked about it is that you have the people with different talents like the earth, water, wind, heart. And when their powers combine, you have this Captain Planet, who is a tough guy, and, and this is the last resort, but very successful. And I also see the collaboration uh, in, in such a way as I was watching the Captain Planet cartoon, uh, because in a collaboration, you have a bunch of talented people uh, with uh, their own values and uh, their uh, knowledge and competences, uh, but the true meaning of collaboration is when uh, our power uh, combines. So um, we have to think uh, always in this way that also not only within the team of our organization but in between us and the public officials that always an earth person or a wind person and we, could, we have to find ourselves we have to synchronize and then there is a captain planet which can be also understood as a very successful CV tech tool. Um, so um, this is kind of an obvious thing why to, uh, why to collaborate because we want to have this Captain Planet successful civic tools uh, but also we have to be honest with, with each other. Is, uh, as a CV tech or as any other organization we're kind of doing a favor to the public officials and we shouldn't feel ashamed of that. Sometimes we feel a bit worse 
because we are these crazy campaigners or activists. Uh, but in fact, we bring in our knowledge and competences. And actually, when I was a public official, I wish that someone would contact me and do me this favor and support me with my work. Because what we're talking about now, very often, and we can hear that through the whole conference here, we're talking about reformers within government. It's very unusual that we have the whole department, the whole ministry, uh, the whole institution supporting what we believe in, which is a successful, um, uh, successful uh, civic engagement on other stuff that we uh, do under the civic uh, tech activity. Uh, but we're doing favors to the public officials, and us that we want to have something in return as a good reforms, as implementing good projects, as working uh, with us in a very uh, open, uh, open, open way. So some general remarks now how the collaboration works, also on the examples of the projects that we are uh, conducting or being part of. Uh, so first of all, uh, why uh, we're talking also about the collaboration is the issue or topic that was discussed during this conference as well. We're talking about solution, not products. Without the collaboration, it's mostly product. So uh, in the case of, um, the, for example, like the Polish case would be uh, the Ministry of Digital Affairs that is also responsible for delivering some IT products uh, is preparing a tool for the people to uh, register for uh, elections. And they did a great job, but they haven't collaborated with uh, electoral committees and the municipalities, which are uh, responsible for that. Uh, so we had a great product, but the people actually couldn't find themselves on the lease because the municipalities had uh, so, um, uh, so too, too, too little time uh, to, to prepare. So from the perspective of the citizen, it doesn't matter if the Ministry of Digital Affairs is doing a press conference and saying, oh, we had a great product, everything worked. But from my perspective, no, because I couldn't vote. I couldn't find my name on the, I couldn't find my uh, name on the list. And if you thinking about the solutions, then you have to also do something that is maybe more, less complicated for us as the civic tech or uh, civic organization, uh, but we very often forgetting about it. And uh, this is uh, to bring un or usual suspects, actually the people that we use the product. I mean, how many of you had people or users at the hackathons? Usually we have tech people, policy people, activists, but we're doing it for someone. So it's really good to engage with the people that we wanted them to see how does they look, not only put them as numbers in metrics. Because very often what we're saying is, yeah, we're having 10K users, but like these are the real people, right? So it's really interesting on one hand, but like, I guess very important to get these people in the room and just ask them, like, how do you like my idea? What do you want to, what do you expect from this product solution, I should say? And uh, this is the example of uh, the thing that we, it's not very, maybe, on digital democracy, but this is interesting stuff that we're doing now, uh, thanks to the cooperation with our German friends from uh, Luftdateninfo, which is the air sensors, uh, that, like, do uh, DIY air sensors. Uh, which is not really complicated unless you are uh, kind of knowledgeable about technology. But what we're trying to do also, organizing the workshops, uh, we uh, invited the public officials and citizens uh, to show them how does it really work. So uh, it's not only that they can uh, read on our website and bought the set, but also we try to find out is it really simple for them to make the product? Because otherwise, they will not use it. So this is one of the example of the of uh, the very like the seniors uh, from one of the municipalities uh, trying to uh, set this uh, air pollution sensor. Um, the fellowship is uh, good when you have this open collaboration. 
uh, which means that uh, you have a good contact with the public institution and you can set up the rules and it's really important in this, uh, in this, from this perspective to set up uh, these rules. Uh, sometimes there is a big disappointment about expectations on, uh, of, uh, on each of the, of each of the party. Uh, I'm, we have a code for Pakistan, I saw somewhere there. Uh, we, we talked a lot about uh, fellowships uh, yesterday, and uh, this is an ongoing process, but this is again something that is a good example of doing a favor to the public institution and also expecting to have something in return like a sustainable uh, policy on open data on producing the civic tech tools. At, uh, et cetera. Um, the other challenge with working with governments, which is a general challenge, is that, as I told you, we have sometimes this image of the crazy campaigners. Like, you know, NGO people are nice people generally, they have good heart, but they're not professional. And uh, very often we have to sell ourselves uh, as, uh, as a business like organization because. This is a very sad uh, uh, statement, uh, but in most of the cases, uh, the public institution uh, want to purchase uh, proposes a certain product. Not necessarily they're thinking about increasing democracy, participation, etc. So um, we have to, I don't want to use that word, but I will use that word, we have to fake a bit. So we have to be, I mean, Try to try to uh, show that we are uh, uh, less NGO and more business-like. I, I I don't want to say fake that we are more professional because I do believe that we are far 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 more professional uh, than businesses uh, in these terms. But uh, we have to sell the products. And one of the examples of our work is that we uh, based on. Uh, our experiences, we pay the central repository of um, data, so like Open Data Gov UK or, um, or Open Data Gov uh, style uh, product for the Polish government several years ago. Uh, and uh, we just uh, kind of pretended uh, that we're uh, more IT organization than civic tech organization. And uh, with IT organization, is like not every public official understands how IT works, so they are kind of afraid of asking questions sometimes. So you have this authority as an IT uh, person. But thanks to that, we have a really successful and, uh, and, uh, and civic-oriented uh, product in, uh, in Poland. But, so these are like general remarks on that. Uh, but uh, how we uh, engage in collaboration in a liberal, de Ill liberal democracy, uh, but I guess this can work also in other cases. Um, I put shaming, but someone told me the shaming is not a great word, so um, you can translate it as healthy um, um, competition. Uh, this is the case of uh, the website of, official website of the Polish Parliament which was really, really bad. Uh, here. So the official website of the parliament in 2009 when we started, I don't see this well, but it was just text and really hard to understand. Some PDFs, the font was like from 19th century uh, Western uh, movie. Uh, and uh, no one really used that, including members of the parliament themselves. So what we thought at the moment, why not to try uh, to build kind of a mirror site, but really good with engaging of uh, some citizens, with engaging of not, maybe not citizens, but activists that really interested in the, in, uh, in the parliament, uh, and some MPs also, because MPs came to us and said like, I don't have a really good access to the documents. I, I mean, I get the hard copies, it's easy to get for me, but it's hard to work when I want to look for something like what happened two weeks ago or something. I don't have you know the whole library with me, um, so we built uh, we built a product based on that. And you know what happened? Only uh, two years after that, uh, well, the the parliament has changed their website based on what we actually did, and uh, the pleasure is all ours. So it's also the part I believe it's also the part of a collaboration because uh, we. 
had this healthy competition with them and the people started to use uh, our site uh, more willingly uh, than they site and they could refer uh, to the on social media they were at the time already uh, or in on, on other occasions that why can't you do the website like the guys from a bicycle foundation did so they feel ashamed and they did and it's uh, and and uh, it's a good it's a good uh, practice the uh, this is an interesting product also uh, of ours and this is especially important in this context of illiberal democracy very briefly uh, one of the things that we are kind of attacking our government is that they're fighting with independence of judiciary and uh, the Ministry of Justice is uh, responsible for that. Uh, at the same time, Ministry of Justice has a database of, uh, uh, of all companies, so the company register. And uh, the company register, as you well know, is a really important tool when it comes to transparency, connect political and business connections, etc. And it's open, but like semi-open. You have to uh, not the name of the organization or the, the company, you have to put the CAPTCHA, so it's like record by record. You can't do the connections like we do in here, for example. This is an example of a net of connections between uh, different uh, um, uh, the people that are responsible for businesses. And um, uh, the problem is that we tried, also with the former government, we tried to say to them that maybe they will be more open and, and like we don't really need to do this thing like it's it's easy we can show them how to do it let's make it available for uh, for everyone uh, they did not um, uh, find it very uh, attractive and they found like many reasons not to do it including the uh, including some legal uh, concerns but we have IT guys working for us and they have IT guys in Ministry of Justice and IT guys are really cool. They are they really like our tool. We have like more than 500k unique users every month, and they appreciate it. So this is our talent: is that we know how to do it, and uh, we. This is a silent collaboration because we working directly and non-formally with the IT department. That they say, if you're scrapping the data between 1 p.m. and 5 p.m. where everyone is going into our register is hard for our service because it's like it's the movement is uh, is is too big. Uh, so please don't scrub between these hours. I'm saying yes, okay, we will not do that uh, during the day. But can you help us with um, putting some documents on in PDFs, but like in a, in a bulk form? And say, okay, possible. This doesn't have to be. Uh, uh, consulted with the Ministry of Justice, of course. So we having this uh, the good product that I believe also uh, is profitable for uh, for um, uh, for citizens and for businesses in Poland. Uh, but uh, we don't cooperate directly with uh, with the Ministry. Uh, open data conspiracy. This is something um, again. Uh, we are quite active on this political thing like in terms of like how political you can be as an NGO but we are and uh, for a lot of public officials and for institutions when they hear our name they prefer not to openly collaborate because they are afraid of the central government and what would be their reaction etc uh, so what we did with the cool guys from the one of the departments in the Ministry of Digital Affairs uh, that are these true reformers uh, is that we asked them, can we write the uh, guidelines on opening data in public administration, but will not use our name. Your name as the Ministry of Digital Affairs will be there. And uh, this is what we did. So uh, we wrote the guidelines of really, I mean, I do believe that, really cool uh, opening data uh, practices, good practices, and uh, the whole uh, policies in the, in the public institutions. But it has been delivered by the uh, ministry itself, so a lot of public institutions uh, can can learn how to how to do it, and also we use that opportunity to connect uh, to connect uh, some of the public officials uh, from different institutions uh, to uh, to work together 
to know what are the true challenges. So we were quite well prepared for, uh, for doing it. We treated public officials, again, as humans. We asked them, I know you have the true problem with opening the data. What is your problem? I mean, what? Uh, just honestly tell me, no one is watching, just tell me what is your true problem. I and mean, we have like really good stories uh, in, the, in the guidelines uh, because of them. I know it's one minute. And uh, the last project I want to I, I wanna show you, this is the one also thanks to the for Code for All network that we're part of. Um, there's uh, the huge problem with the uh, Polish Electoral Commission in the terms they don't have capacity. There's like few people, uh, they don't have funds for like truly checking what's going on on election day when it comes to the potential irregularities. Uh, so we scaled uh, um, a, a tool from our friends from Code from, for Romania, and we did a, um, a tool that we had the results of any irregularities uh, in, uh, with the help, of course, of like more than 100 volunteers uh, at, uh, at uh, the end of uh, the election day. And uh, the Electoral Commission that saw the data, they were really happy about it because they, they, have, they, they could use it. Uh, for uh, for making uh, their own statements uh, the very uh, night. So um, the questions for you that I want to leave you with that and just like think about it uh, would be in the context how do you know it was worth to do it uh, is uh, what are you best in? I mean Ed, it's uh, find your talent, what do you think is the best suitable way of, of, of being active in the field because we are the best uh, at what we are best at. Uh, which means that I do feel with my heart that I prefer this kind of a silent collaboration, for example, because I don't want to make uh, arrangements for two years to meet with the minister, find your own uh, way and be self-confident about your talents, basically. And what is the most important stuff I think also in Captain Planet, it was this hard guy. Uh, and uh, even though I'm a boring lawyer, I think in what we're doing, and even with collaborating with boring, frustrated public officials, sometimes frustrated, uh, this is my story again, uh, is that we are human beings, and we have to feel ourselves a bit. Thank you. Sorry for that. Uh... Thanks, Christoph. Uh, we hand over now to Dawn and Jill, and I will bring up their presentation. Yeah. Oh, um, I'm sure that should I just, do we just want to scooch this down and then I'll stand on this side? I will do whatever you want me to do. Uh, yeah, okay. Oh, okay, great. Yeah. Okay, as long as we're cool here. I can just stand up here. Ooh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, wait, on. now how do I turn it on? Uh, it should be on. Oh, it's on. Yeah, it's on. Yeah. Cool. Uh, wonderful. Well, uh, thank you all for being here. I know it's uh, late in the day after a long uh, couple days of fun that we've all been having. So thank you for taking the time to be with us today. And thank you to Tic Tac for having us. It's been really great to have um, some incredible conversations and learn a lot from everyone who's been here. Um, so we talked a little bit about uh, who we are. Uh, we sit on the National Advisory Council for Code for America. And Jill also is leading up a local chapter in uh, Charlotte called Open Charlotte. And I've for a few years was running Code for Philly in Philadelphia in the US. Um, so what I want to talk to you about today is some of the things that we've learned from our time in doing uh, volunteerism within civic technology, um, some of the things that we have, some of the lessons that we've gained, also some of the approaches that we've seen from just working closely with, uh, you know, probably hundreds of captains personally, but also things that we've seen from thousands of people in different attempts that they've made. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about how uh, civic tech in the volunteer context can have pr uh, practical applications and uh, scalable impacts. Uh, so a little bit more about why we want to talk about this, why talk about volunteering in civic tech in particular. Uh, there's a lot of energy around uh, this movement, right? There's a lot of energy around civic tech generally. We've heard a lot of really interesting efforts that are happening both in terms of private companies, nonprofits, um, activists, networks, all kinds of stuff. Um, and as it matures and grows, volunteering is going to be part of that. So uh, we want to think about how do these things continue on. Oh. You know, I should give you a little picture of Code for America. 
Um, and so we'll, we'll be uh, solidifying what the replicable strategies are for volunteering. And there's a lot of focus on engagement of end users, right? Talking about uh, building with, not for, making sure that we're engaging citizens and residents so that they can be part of the design process and make a collaborative and co-create solutions together. Um, and volunteering in this context uh, is really empowering people at the root, at the grassroots of this, right? People who are uh, in communities are the ones who could be organizing those communities, and self-organized communities are also going to be uh, more effective and more sustainable than just having people who are in positions of uh, structured efforts. Um, so we also want to talk about uh, volunteering being unique because uh, it is really uh, going to be um, pushing forward. It's, it's organizing around shared ideals, and that's pushing forward this idea of civic tech as a social movement. And uh, Code for America at the network level has been talking more and more about how we see this as a movement and how this work can support that. Um, so some of the other pieces here is just making the uh, volunteerism more structured um, and making it so that we can scale it because as we become more structured and focused, um, then we're able to really leverage what volunteerism can do in terms of adding capacity to things that already exist, um, especially for when we're talking about government efforts who are under-resourced or nonprofits who need support. Having highly skilled volunteers is going to be uh, very helpful and impactful. Um, a little bit more about Code for America for anyone who doesn't know in the Brigade Network. Code for America was started in 2009 and began a fellowship program in 2011 and the second cohort was 2012. Um, the idea with those fellowships was actually putting in a technologist in city government to push forward on some of these changes of what are the cultural changes that we can make? What is possible? Um, how can we rapidly iterate and prototype? And um, we, from that, organically grew brigades because we wanted to continue that work. The fellowships only lasted a year. And how do we continue that forward? Having people at the local level who wanted to continue this work was going to be um, pretty much the way that this continues on. Um, and it just it organically grew from there. And in six years, we now are at uh, 75 chapters across the country and over 25,000 highly skilled volunteers of designers, people who are data scientists, obviously developers, um, but a, a wide variety of people who are uh, volunteering for the effort that, we, that we're putting forward. Um, and there are a lot of things that we will cover. Um, I'm going to go ahead and um, pass the mic over to Jill just to talk more about some of the methods that we've seen um, and some of the strategies that uh, we hope to continue putting structure around. Thanks. Okay. Fair enough. <laughs> hey, everyone. Um, okay. So, um, so we have four different methods of engagement that we want to talk to you today about. Um, applications, advocacy, community building, and uh, as a technical consultant. Um, so applications. Obviously, this one's a given, right? This is a traditional form of ways for volunteers to engage. Um, it's an easy opportunity to um, participate, especially for a tech-driven um, community, and um, it can build like network sharing really well because code is easy to, to share. Um, so as an example of this, we've got CourtBot. CourtBot was started in 2014 in Atlanta, and um, the, the city of Atlanta annually um, issues about 200,000 uh, traffic citations. So CourtBot is a uh, text system that texts you a reminder of when your court date is. Super simple. Um, it turns out about 200,000 citations issued, about 20% of those people forget to show up for their date. Well, if you don't, in the U.S., if you don't show up for your court date, it's you issued a bench warrant and arrested the next time you're pulled over for anything. Um, <clears throat> What, once they issued, the, once um, in the first year of implementation of this, uh, we saw, they saw a 15% decline in bench warrants issued, which means people are actually remembering to show up because we've sent them a reminder. Seeing the success, um, Code for Tulsa wanted to bring CourtBot to their city. So what they did was they uh, redeployed the original app, improved the code, made it easier for other cities to deploy it as well, um, set up some uh, processes, documented it well, and then ran a pilot. Well, they had similar results. So next up, 
is Anchorage, Alaska. And they've done it and had similar results. Um, within this year, you're going to see it deployed in um, Savannah and Charlotte as well. Um, so, it's a great um, it's a great example of not only the easy access points of technology, but also um, how smaller organizations can um, share with each other. The struggle with uh, applications is if you don't have a large tech base and you don't have a lot of developers, it's really hard to maintain these applications, even if you do get them built. Um, and um, that, that can minimize your network sharing ideas. Um, another one is advocacy. So this is a little bit newer for us because as we're maturing as a volunteer group, we're moving more into an idea that this is a movement, not just a network of individual organizations. Um, so, and it also kind of changes the way we use tech. It makes tech the tool and not the solution. Um, which is the reason what makes tech have a lasting change. An example of this is Chai Hack Night in Chicago's um, Pet Coke project. So if you don't know what Pet Coke is, because I didn't either until I checked it out, um, it's petroleum coke. It's a byproduct of refining oil. Um, it, it looks like a great dirt and apparently is just stored outside in piles. Well, Chicago's nicknamed the Windy, Windy City for a reason. And as the wind would blow over these exposed piles of pet coke, it picks up a really fine dust and spreads it for miles. Well, that dust, when it's inhaled, um, gets stuck in the filters in your lungs and causes serious health problems. So um, what, when Chai Hack and I found out about this problem, that there was an act, a group that was doing advocacy around it, they decided to use some tech to help. They built this, it's an alert system, again, using text messages to alert people when the conditions around the stations that had these exposed um, piles was dangerous. Not only did they um, be able, were they able to warn citizens, but they collected that data. And in a six month period, had 92 days of high risk. Took that data to city council and got an ordinance passed changing the way that pet coke is stored in the city of Chicago. Um, so now we can see this lasting change happen because we use tech as the tool and not as the solution. <laughs> um, so this policy, when we were able to bring this policy forward, it also provides a social justice aspect that we're actually working in a social movement. Another um, way that we engage with government is an, as a community builder. Um, these are very easy relationships because we're used to building relationships with government, right? So we just build them with the community as well. Um, it promotes diversity. We actually live up to our deals of build with, not for, when we have the community members in the room during the design process. So one of these projects um, that gives a great example of this is Code for Asheville. They wanted to have their users front and center um, through the design process. And um, in order to uh, develop a relationship that would get those users in the room, they um, worked with a community group called Beloved that is already doing really great impactful work um, in Asheville around supporting their homeless community. So they built this relationship. They had a lot of conversations. They figured out what the community actually needs from the community and then help them. What that ended up doing on the short term is they built a um, computer lab in, um, inside one of the community centers that they support. Um, they are there to provide technical help for the, the members using it when they need help accessing something when, you know, maybe they're, and help with digital literacy. Uh, next, this year they're planning on doing some digital literacy classes as well. Um, to support this type of a project. It has been so successful, but because we're living up to that idea of build with and not for, that um, it's creating a stronger connection between the technology and the community and the users and better conversations. Um, again, this is also being packaged and redeployed around the network um, as a community ambassadorship program. 
So our last one is a tech consultant. So this is the, the this is the most unique way that we can interact with government, and um, admittedly, not all governments are going to be open to this. It's extremely new <laughs> way, um, but basically, the idea is that we have a, we are available to have a jargon-free conversation about technology. Um, not all departments inside government are tech savvy. Um, oftentimes, the IT departments are stretched thin. They don't have time to sit on in on every vendor meeting that the city has. So in Charlotte, um, we do this type of um, consulting with our local government. Um, kind of how it started is that one of our projects, um, one of our volunteers wanted to do a um, redo our adopt a street program. So um, basically the adopt a street is you get you are assigned a one mile range of a street, of city street, and you agree to go and clean it once a month. You pick up the trash, you pick up the litter, you report back that you did it, they put up a sign, it's a great, you know, it's a great way to uh, get your uh, residents to invest in the city and feel like they own the stake of the city, right? So, um, however, the tech that surrounds it is bad. It's not user friendly, it's hard to use, it's hard to report. It's not mobile friendly, even though you're out on the street, it would be the easiest time to report back that you did it, right? So we had um, one of our volunteers wanted to revamp it. Um, after having conversations with the city, we figured out very, very quickly that what the city needed was a way larger scope than what volunteers were able to produce. Um, and so we flipped gears. And instead of um, actually building the tech, we help them write an RFP that involved their users, involved um, good tech, and um, let them like explain how the tech should work so that they could explain to us what they wanted it to do. Um, what this did was we created an RFP that ended up coming in on time, under budget, and um, the adoption rate has been about 90%. So it's improving. Um, so it's an unusual way to, to interact, though. Um, but this has built a really interesting relationship between um, our organization and the government. Because they don't see us as free labor, they see us as a technical partner. Somebody who can come in and explain what jargon is, can explain what tech is, and our only agenda is to make the tech better and to make them more efficient. Um, so we get, better like, we get better technology, they spend less money, it works for everybody, right? And procurement is broken, so it helps fix little bits of it at least. So um, the biggest thing with these methods, and the one reason I wanted to, to go over four of them, um, is because no method fits all governments. No, um, so you can't expect to be able to deploy all four of these methods with any one government. But having a good toolkit allows you to interact with a local government the way they will invite you into the room and um, allows you to have better conversations about how you, can, how you can participate, how you can help, and how you can build that relationship. I'm gonna hand it back to Don to tell you more. <laughs> I don't remember what you were Some more things. <laughs> um, it is like five o'clock on the last day. Um, so I just wanted to quickly uh, talk a little bit more about this. I think what's um, consistent here is that all of these approaches uh, are high touch. They require quite a bit of context. Usually volunteers have been in government. They have a lot of familiarity. Um, so that's great. And we still want to keep that approach, right? That's going to continue to be really important to keep highly skilled volunteers. But if we don't want civic tech to be niche, we need to grow that base. And by decomposing problems and making this something where I can come in and very quickly pick an issue off the backlog, you know, write some code and submit and push, you know, that's what's going to be important for this. So that's something that uh, as we continue to mature from the volunteer perspective, we're continuing to add you know, that structure that we were talking about and focus for volunteers so that we can that we can have uh, more of that and more tiers of leadership um, and, and all of that good stuff. Um, I'm just going to open that. You need my fingerprint, sorry. <laughs> oh, do I? Okay, perfect. Um, wonderful. Well, we didn't use these notes at all. Nice. Uh, you know. I just write them, I don't use them. Anyway. <laughs> um, wonderful. Okay, great. So, so yeah, so let me do this. 
Um, yeah, so just what uh, Jill was saying, I think that we want to have a different, a variety of different approaches so that we can be somewhat nimble. Um, right now, we spend a lot of time working with government and building relationships with them. Um, that's not something that everyone can do. Oftentimes, people aren't going to invite you to do technical consulting if you haven't spent probably two or three um, years building a relationship over time. Um, we've, we've gotten pretty good at that. Um, the uh, oops, there's a few things that I wanted to mention, um, and also it, it doesn't make as much sense for volunteers. Some uh, the brigades, some brigades are five volunteers, and some are five thousand. So having a variety of tools that we share uh, throughout the network makes it easier to say Charlotte did this. What version of that can we do in Maine? Who only has five volunteers? Um, and also government can have kind of a similar situation where you might have one really great champion or you might have somebody who, a government that has an entire digital services team, um, which is often awesome. So a variety of approaches, uh, it ma makes it possible for us to uh, act within the constraints and the resources that we have. And it also means that we can be more inclusive of end users. I think that's the other big piece for us is that being situated where we're at, we're not, uh, we don't have a business interest. There's no agenda. So we get to be situated in between government and actual community members, and we just get to be part of that community. And so it's more of a facilitation. And that just, uh, that lack of an agenda, I think it's really helpful for us pushing forward on both sides. Um, and uh, yeah, and again, so for us, the, the, t the technology is the tool. And so making the focus of this more about the social change that we want to affect. Um, that is where we see bringing in these relationships and um, you know all the things that we've talked about this weekend but again actually putting them into practice it's pretty messy and we're kind of okay with that um, you know that will probably evolve over time but um, sometimes being messy but having good collaboration is a higher priority um, so uh, call, your call to action is to get involved um, whoops uh, there's a few different ways like you know, obviously working with people at Code for Poland or Code for Pakistan, um, there is an entire global movement that's happening, not just in America, but all across the world. And so if you have a local chapter, join it. If you don't have a local chapter, start one. Um, and also uh, some things that I would love to talk with people after the session or just in general, um, how can we be better partners? I think that what we can offer as volunteers and a lot of us is to add capacity to efforts that are already happening. I don't think any volunteer really wants to reinvent the wheel or start something brand new, how can we help support something that's already existing? Um, and then a uh, big thank you, our contact info. Uh, also a big thank you to Code for France who had a great soiree on Monday night. Was that right? Is that Monday night? Um, but yeah, thank you again for, for your time and attention. Please reach out with any questions or thoughts or general feedback for us. Um, and hope you guys have a great rest of the Tic Tac. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dylan Dorn. We'll hand so, right over. Juggle all these things. Hey, <laughs> so hello. I have the honor of being the last speaker of this conference, I guess. <laughs> thanks for staying with us till the end. Uh, thanks to my society for putting it together once again. I had an amazing time. Uh, my name is Benjamin. I work at uh, Technologie Stiftung Berlin. We are a, a local nonprofit from Berlin, uh, working mostly on digital transformation of uh, government. And I'm directing a bunch of projects at uh, Technologie Stiftung, and the one I'm going to talk about today is called ODIS. It's our closest cooperation with government so far. And ODIS is an attempt to uh, support government in delivering quality data sets to its citizens. It's a very hands-on approach, meaning we're not so much working on a, on a policy level with Otis, but really um, doing a hands-on uh, uh, support team that will go into the administration, sit down with people on their computers, and uh, help them to uh, release data. Uh, so our first anniversary is coming up, and um, I'm thankful for the opportunity to share some, uh, some of our experiences from the first year. Um, but I'd like to start by giving you a short rundown of the story so far. So Berlin moved quite early um, on the open data stage um, compared to other German cities. Uh, it was one of the first in 2012 with an open data strategy and in 2013 with an open data portal. 
Then between 2013 and 2016, uh, not that much really happened. I mean, the, the portal was designed in a way that every public servant basically could upload data. Some did, but there was also a lot of confusion on what open data actually is. And uh, in general, the quality of the open data portal was not that good. Uh, then in 2016, we passed the e-government law. Uh, and as part of that, also an open data law that turned the whole project from a voluntary into a mandatory exercise for public servants, and after that still not much happened. Um, why? So um, I think you see a classic example of the, of the problems in digital governments, that is the gap between uh, strategies and laws on the one hand and delivery on the other hand. Uh, most governments are quite good at strategies and laws, they've been doing that for centuries, um, and writing an e-government law is not that different from writing, let's say, a traffic law or a housing law. Um, but really delivering on these strategies is a whole different uh, story and is uncharted territory for lots of uh, public servants. Um, so um, while the top level executives um, see their job done once they have the, the nice strategy or uh, the law, uh, the public servants that are really working on the ground often feel uh, kind of left alone and also a bit lost. Um, with uh, actually putting it into practice. So I wrote a study for Berlin's government two years ago um, evaluating the situation and uh, one of my recommendations was to set up something like an open data help desk or support team inside of government uh, for all these questions. And people in government liked this idea but also told me it was impossible in a reasonable time frame to establish a, a new unit inside of government. So what they asked was if we could set up the team for them, they would fund it. Um, we as a like, non-profit foundation would provide the team and we, we tried to cooperate in that way. So uh, we did. Uh, this is our team, so um, Open Data Informationsstelle, that's a long name for Otis. We picked a name that was just unsexy enough so government could relate to it, uh, but we call it Otis in short. Um, we built, we are five people, these are my four uh, dear colleagues. We built a very um, diverse team, also with very uh, diverse backgrounds. That was uh, important to us because we really wanted to combine the public policy and administration expertise with the technical delivery um, capacity. So I'm really happy to have uh, both on the team and also have, for example, a UX designer on the team who can make data look good. These are some, these are things that are, can be important factors if you want to motivate or, uh, or build incentives for public servants. Um, let's see. So. Yeah, what do we do? We do um, meetups just for knowledge sharing uh, inside of government. We uh, also help government locate and evaluate data. So we look at a lot of Excel sheets, still the uh, tool of choice for government uh, when it comes to data. Um, we also offer courses and workshops uh, where we teach basically data literacy and um, the use of especially open source software. Um, to work with data and we also build demonstrators and prototypes that really try to, to demonstrate the, the value inherent in these data sets. Um, but in many ways we're still uh, in the process of figuring out what works, uh, what resonates with government. Um, so we keep readjusting, we readjusted a few times. Um, we basically started with um, a very uh, kind of naive assumption coming more from an activist background um, we thought, well, government has all the data, it just needs to be published. They don't publish it right now because probably because they're ignorant or because they lack the digital skills, so we will just educate them um, and then it will be fine. Um, once we like, really started to work behind the scenes and really went into government, we realized that the situation is much more uh, complex, um, a lot of complex structures, complex processes, a lot of mixed motivations, uh, a lot of confusion and fear. So nowadays we uh, see ourselves rather as, uh, as therapists than as activists. So uh, in the beginning we would go into a meeting and show them our open data slides and they said, hey, there's a lot of you know, value in data and it's really easy to do. But now we just go into a meeting and are like, okay guys, where does it hurt the most? <laughs> Tell us. <laughs> and then we listen and then we try to take it from there, right? Um, so our relation uh, with government uh, up to this day is still not that easy. Um, there are lots of public servants who appreciate what we do, especially those that have worked with us uh, in releasing data, really uh, appreciate our help. 
but um, there are lots of people in government who find us downright annoying, who are, um, you know, who have the opinion that as an outsider you cannot really understand what's going on inside of government. Um, and it's a it's a delicate balance because I think to some to some point we have to annoy. If we if we wouldn't annoy anybody, we would not be doing good work. So because we always try also to challenge, to support on the one hand, challenge on the other. Um, so the main conflict is us saying, guys, you have to do better, and them saying, guys, you have to understand better before you try to give us advice. And it's probably it's like a 50-50 distribution of who's right. So uh, there are many cases where we have to understand more and learn more. And I've collected now, after almost one year of work, I've collected uh, four lessons, uh, our main takeaways from now. So I'd like to present you with four lessons. Lesson one. Um, lesson one is we really underestimated how hard it is to locate data in a government with about 100,000 employees. Crazy, really. So um, governments work with data for decades or for centuries, but still are not really data-driven organizations in many ways. So um, the whole data management uh, in Berlin is really not that good, and I think uh, many other cities uh, are in the same situation. Um, so maybe to give you an example, just to make it more clear. So a, a simple statistical request, a member from parliament would maybe ask something like how many children in Berlin are in childcare and different facilities or have special needs and um, asks for the statistics. Uh, at that point, you would assume that maybe you just need to, uh, to push a button to get this data out of, a, out of a database. In reality, what happens is the, someone from the mayor's office would call someone from the Department of you know, Youth and Education who would then call all 12 districts in Berlin with a high degree of autonomy in doing childcare and ask every one of them, like how many kids you have, how many childcare centers you have. Then in every of the 12 departments, someone would start hunting for this data, call other people, and then after a few days or weeks, you would get replies from all districts. Some would maybe send an Excel sheet, some would uh, send an export from a database, some would send a PDF from 2014 because this is the last time they checked. Uh, some would reply something like, we don't know because the person is on parental leave or is sick or um, we cannot reply. And this is standard procedure and uh, it's also very domain specific, means that if you would ask for uh, data from different, different domain, you basically have to start from, from zero. Um, my dear colleague Alexandra recently went hunting for data on uh, drinking water wells in Berlin. There should be about 2,000 drinking water wells, so for emergency situations you could get drinking water. And uh, after two weeks of research, she sent me this, um, she still didn't find the data, but she mapped out all systems that somehow have to do with this, and um, she told me she, she keeps searching, but the data is probably somewhere in here, these are all different departments, different uh, IT systems and so on. So it's really um, basically what you see, we, in the beginning we had a very objectified view of data. We just thought data is there, it ha just has to be released. But in reality it's a very complex web of practices uh, in which data can crystallize at some point maybe and sometimes also not. Um, so while we started with the idea of we'll, we'll just help you to open data, now we are more like let's look for the data together and maybe we'll find it. Um, lesson two, publishing data needs a, a purpose. This is super important, we learned. Um, in the beginning, uh, we, as many other activists, would just tell government, just release the raw data. There are enough people out there who will do interesting things with it. Governments employees never really got the why they should do it. It's extra work for them and just the idea that some, somewhere somebody will make something with it was just not enough as an, as an incentive for them. Uh, so once we started to uh, uh, propose actual data-driven projects, like services that would be fueled through open data, um, we got a much more response and much higher interest um, in actually working with data. So for example, we completely rebuilt the data pipeline from the health departments where they measure water quality of the lakes in Berlin uh, and rebuilt it in a way that we could put a front end here, a citizen information service, if you want to go swimming, where can you do that, is the water clear and so on. Um, 
the government had no interest in the beginning of releasing the data, but once we showed them like the design sketches of the front end, they were really down and said, wow, this is a cool project. Um, and it, wa it wasn't really hard to do. I mean, our designer could do this in a day or two, and then also the, it's, it's a very simple uh, web app. Um, but it made government really happy. It also made some press, and it, it got quite a lot of users. So, uh, and this was a similar thing with public funding data. We built an information tool for citizens that now is mostly used by government themselves because they like it so much to analyze whatever they spend. Um, but uh, in both cases, um, open data was published along the way. It wasn't the end goal, but it just happened at some point because we built these services. So basically, we moved from the, the just publish some data to let's build something cool together. Uh, lesson three is a civic tech textbook a classic, um, ask forgiveness not permission. We learned that this is also very true if you work inside of government. Um, government is of course very uh, rule driven and uh, for, for good reason, but it also has this mindset of uh, everything that is not explicitly allowed is probably forbidden. And we try to turn this around and by saying everything that is not forbidden is probably allowed, so let's just try and do it. Uh, and the main example is that uh, government employees um, are not allowed to install software on their computer, of course, and they have very old and shitty software. Um, but they have one like super power tool on their computer, and that is the web browser. Ever since they changed to uh, Mozilla's Firefox um, from Internet Explorer, it's even better. Um, and what we did also with the way that the JavaScript and, and web ecosystem has developed, uh, we built lots of small tools that run on our own servers um, and, and government uh, people can access them through that browser um, without asking anyone for permission. So the of official IT department from government probably doesn't know that these uh, little tools are running and we are able to to build a, a complete ecosystem of small tools and, and web apps around uh, the, the very bad software that is on, on uh, public servants' computers. Um, and, you know, this is not illegal. It's, it's perfectly fine. It's rather, it's a gray area that is not really regulated because most of the rules come from a time when no one would, would actually do that. Um, so in the beginning, we, we would often ask um, before we do such things, and now we just do them and see if anyone would uh, try to stop us. And in most uh, ways, we just um, get along with it. Um, lesson four already sums up my talk. Um, and this is really something from my experience. Um, I talk, I speak with government employees on a weekly basis, and I hardly ever met mm -hmm. someone who was intrinsically motivated to um, be more open. Um, and they're not against being open, but it's really nothing that really drives them or gives their job purpose. But they really, there is a sincere and honest drive to offer better services. This is where uh, public servants really can find their purpose and where they are also willing to, you know, walk the extra mile and put on some extra work. Um, because they are not against digital transformation. Digital is the new normal and um, they all use smartphones and they all are frustrated that government is not uh, able to, um, to offer good digital services. So once you, you manage to, to, to show them that making things open can also make things better, this was one of the, of the main claims from the British GDS as well, um, they will be down to, to work with you on that, and I know it's a bit it's a bit a controversial topic because you could also say, as a, a civil society activist, you could say transparency is a right. Uh, it's, it shouldn't be a question if government wants to do this or not. Um, they have to do it. But from the inside perspective, where we are working, the, the question of motivation and incentives is really important because if they have no motivation, motivation, they'll find ways not to do it, uh, no matter what the uh, what the legal situation is um, with something that is so confusing as, as open data, you can always find excuses why this data cannot be published. Um, so if this is true, that making things open will also make things better, and I really think that it is, uh, then I think now's the time to show it. And um, 
uh, now I'm able to, to close the circle to Rebecca's opening uh, keynote a bit um, because I think civil society can really play, or actors like us can really play an important role uh, in that, in, in also um, showing, um, because we proposed that for a long time. We, we said, make things open, it makes things better, but we have to ask ourselves, did we really uh, deliver on that promise so far? Because the public servants that followed us in the early phase and released data, they're still wait, waiting for that value to realize that we promised. So we should also uh, look critically at ourselves and, uh, and look how we can make uh, uh, the things better. And of course, at the same time, um, rethink what government can be and rethink government in a more inclusive and participatory uh, Wait. Well, thank you. I think I'm early. That's interesting. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thank you, Benjamin, and all our speakers. I'd like to open up the floor to questions. Uh, and whilst you're thinking of your questions, I'll abuse my position by asking the first one. Um, in the back of my mind, as you were all talking, I think it came up maybe obliquely in all your presentations, I was thinking about money and I wonder what your experiences are. I really like the description of the relationship between civic tech and government as it's complicated. What's your experience around what happens when a financial element comes in? Has that been necessary? Has it been something you've avoided, particularly in the context of lots of volunteer effort? I'd be interested to hear what your experiences have been. Um, I can talk about I think that will work for all three of us. That's amazing. Um, so it is complicated. Um, with um, the city of Charlotte's actually our um, uh, Open Charlotte's primary funder. Um, we do a couple of projects that they give us um, a decent amount of money to maintain, and um, we charge them to do a beginning project. Um, we have a we sign a volunteer. It's, we call it a skilled volunteer engagement. It basically says. We're volunteers. We're not giving you a timeline, but um, in order to support volunteer work, there is a cost. Um, it's very hard to get people to come and work in the evening if you don't feed them. Um, there's a cost, and so um, you're going to support that. I have found that when they have to shell out, even if it's like $1,500 for a project, it's so much easier to get a meeting. It's easier to get it on their like radar. It becomes a priority for them. And then I'm not sitting around waiting for months for them to like come up with, you know, that piece of data I asked for. So it is complicated. Like we, um, government works better in contracts, and that's why we created like um, we adopted and modified um, another nonprofit's um, contract that they that they use with companies. Um, because government likes to have def de like definition around relationships. That's just kind of how they, they operate. So um, it's complicated, but we don't, I don't, we don't feel beholden to them because of it. Um, I, we might be lucky on that front. Um, I mean, we're, I think we are in a very privileged situation as far as government is funding our project. Um, and we're even growing because after a few months, another department came and asked, can we also you know, sponsor you and you may hire another person? So we're really growing. Um, I think we are actually quite cheap in a way for them uh, because we offer some return and um, they are used to spend a lot of money uh, on IT. And right now they have the money and they have the pressure and sometimes I have the feeling they don't really know what to do with the money. And for them it's very hard to hire their own people. It's a very complicated process and no one wants to work in government. And you, you, we had this discussion before. Um, we can offer a work environment that for younger people is, uh, is inspiring. You know, we have MacBooks and we have free drinks and whatnot. Um, so we had no problem finding very talented people um, and for government, especially since we offer the full package, not only data but also a front end and a web app um, and we, we are a non-profit, we just charge the, our personal costs, we do not make a profit from it. So in the end it's very cheap for government and a project like this we're just doing it with with our basic personnel, so um, I think it's a very good deal for them. 
and they realize that. I, I would say, of course, it's, I don't know if it works with that. Um, it's complicated again, uh, and it's at different angles. Uh, the first one is that, in general, uh, which is maybe good for public finances sometimes, public officials and public institutions are very strict with money. So, that's a general problem with not agile public procurement because this is the, the most of the uh, opportunities um, for, for getting funds. From the uh, from the government is coming from the public procurement, uh, but the very important thing, uh, which is an ethical question at some point also for us, it's whether we really want to um, got money from the government that uh, our civic part uh, of of civic tech uh, is monitoring. Uh, so, in several um, several cases, but we actually took the the money we propose really dumping prices because then we just say like this is important we want to do that but like we don't want anyone to show to to say later that they did it for money we can always like we did really like it was symbolically so that's uh, that's a big big struggle and maybe like that's a that's a discussion that also might be the part of the civic tech movement like how you cooperate with the government, and it doesn't matter if it's liberal democracy or liberal democracy, and uh, to try to you know arrange that in the, the same way that you are independent, because at the end of the day, what really drives us as well is a freedom, and this is also like for me personally, one of the reasons I left the public office is that I couldn't breathe. Uh, and it was hard, and I, I completely, when Benjamin was, was talking, I was just uh, remembering myself uh, from these times, and, 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 and this is something that is, is problematic in the way, but optimistically, I hope that it also will change, and uh, there are more and more reformers also within the government itself, so I believe the system, the first are individual reformers, but the whole system will change, because again, technology and the agile approach is exactly what everyone need in the contemporary um, uh, governance. Thanks. Uh, any questions from other people? Uh, thanks. That was really interesting. I guess my question is mostly for the Code for America folks that might be applicable. I'm wondering, it sounds like you've had a couple successes of spinning something from one brigade to others. Um, and I'm just wondering sort of how, how you go about making that happen and do you have any processes in place? Um, and I think more broadly for, for everybody is how you take successes and, and spread them to other places, whether it's within a larger national government or within you know, the city government. Do you want to build the Yeah. Um, yeah, great question. So uh, in terms of what makes the redeployment successful is a lot of um, networking between these brigades, probably more than anything. Um, it's something that resonated a lot with your talk, actually, was uh, just this idea that everyone wants better government, but knowing how to do it is not as straightforward. And so having something that you can literally pull down with code and kind of build off of that is a huge step forward. So um, there's some, like, just you know, awareness issues of like, oh, making sure that I know what Charlotte's doing and, and um, being able to ping that person directly and then say, what did you actually have to do? Help me, you know, figure out the steps. And then there's some tooling, right? So like having something like GitHub and having some shared, I think we have some shared standards that we follow for um, certain, you know, uh, uh, forget how it's like set up, but we have some code for it. Like code for America has a variety of like different things that are set up to kind of create the ease of use for that. Um, so that's like a tooling uh, perspective, I guess. And then in terms of how do you, um, I think that something that's on our minds a lot is how do you get people to do that uh, in a more directed fashion? So like people wanting to do it because it fits their use case in that context, that's great. But uh, what we want to do is be able to say, you know, is this thing the most replicable and is this thing the most um, value for somebody's time? Because that's kind of the currency of volunteering is like time, right? So it's like if I, you know, have a nice like app that shows me where my bus is, that's great. And we have like 10 of those. Uh, so we don't need any more versus, oh, this helps reduce your, this helps reduce uh, institu uh, institutionalized racism because you don't have a bench warrant because you now you can go to work because now you don't have a bench warrant and now you're not getting stuck. Like those differences are huge. So I think um, sort of where we're thinking about is how do we focus that energy so that it's helping in those larger intractable issues. 
Um, I think I would only add one other thing. Um, documentation. Documentation, like all of the documentation. <laughs> so um, it's the thing that nobody ever likes to do. Nobody likes to document how you do something, but um, one of the really important things with Corebot is it's not just the code that's documented, it's the process and the relationship. So they documented what department you need to go talk to to get um, to get the data to put in, um, you know, on the text messages. Like it, um, and they get like depending on what uh, city. Sometimes that changes a little bit, but like there are generally three, you know, in the U.S. there are generally three different departments you would go to. Ideally, most of the time it's held in the public defender's office. So go make a friend in the public defender's office. Um, and the documentate like the documentation for that specific project isn't just the code; it's the relationship you have to build and the code. And I think that's a really important piece on like sharing between a network. Um, that relationship's not always going to translate, especially when you're talking country to country. But um, it, I, oftentimes I think it sparks that idea. Like you're like, oh, well, you know, like if you know that it's the public defender for us, I'm like, well, okay, that gives me a starting point, right? Um, and then I can go figure out where that's at. Yeah, documentation is especially important uh, in the terms of uh, scaling the things from country to country. What also we do in uh, Code for All Network as the example of uh, this uh, vote monitoring app. Uh, and uh, plus you have, um, you know, this language, like linguistic uh, problem. So uh, this is also important from the, uh, from the perspective of, of ID people to have a good uh, code documentation in that regard. But also what we're doing um, in different networks, but Code for All is, uh, is a great example, is uh, we're just having some kind of a fellowships uh, between together. Also, we're gathering, like last year, for example, we gather with three organizations, including from South Africa, Poland, and Romania, just like for two weeks, and we discuss how to open up the legislation. And uh, you have different legal cultures, so you have different perspectives, and actually you're also coming out from your own routine, and uh, some good ideas just uh, just happened, even though that you, at the first sight, you think it's like, What's the point of talking with people from South Africa? As the legal system is completely different, uh, but I believe something nice was born from that. Actually, I don't have anything. <laughs> I agree with you guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, just remains to thank all our speakers again for a really fabulous end to Tic Tech, and thank you all for joining us. We hope you do again in the future. Thank you.